Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Read Science, where Jeff, uh, my co-host Jeff, and I uh, talk to interesting writers who are approach the topics of science and engineering and math on occasion uh, and we uh, just ask them uh, about their projects and how they do what they do to make science engaging and compelling for the general public. Today I am really excited to have as our guest journalist Lynn Schur who has written a really engaging book about Sally Ride, America's first woman in space. Base. Lynn, why don't you say hi before I finish up your biography here? Hi, Joanne. I'm delighted to be here with you, and hi to everybody out there. We're so we're so glad you could join us. So, Lynn, sure. If you're not aware, if you have avoided the TV for the past several decades, <laughs> I shouldn't I shouldn't put that much on you. But Lynn, sure, is a career TV journalist, spending many of her years at ABC as a correspondent for 2020. Her past reports on 2020 include the increase in HIV among older women, a full one-hour report on Audrey Santos, a young girl in Massachusetts whose life in a coma had inspired a series of unexplained religious phenomena. In an unusually personal report, Schur interviewed baseball players Daryl Strawberry and Eric Davis about their battles with colon cancer and revealed that she too was a recent survivor of the disease. And you've written a book on that as well. So uh, Lynn had reported on all the space shuttle flights and landings, starting with STS-1. She anchored ABC News special coverage of the shuttle launches, landings, and spacewalks, including the explosion of Space Shuttle Challenger. She covered the investigation into the cause of the explosion and obtained the only interview with astronaut Sally Ride, um, a member of the Rogers Commission. In 1988, Schur anchored and reported a one-hour ABC News close-up beyond the shuttle, examining the current status of America's space program and its ability to conduct the next generation of space missions. In May of 1986, she was chosen as one of 40 semifinalists for the Journalist in Space project, which did not happen, but you will love to have you hear about that. So. Uh, Without further ado, what I'd love to do is to have um, Jeff uh, throw out the first question to our guest, Sally Wright's biographer, Lynn Scherf. Lynn, it is a delight to have you here and to talk about your book that that is engaging and, and a really important book, too, for, for the many things it tells people who weren't there at the time or even those of us who were. Now. The subtitle of this biography of Sally Ride is America's First Woman in Space, and it's, it's a factually true statement, and you also give some anecdotes that relate to this in the book. But I think a big topic of the book that comes under that heading is the significance of Sally Ride uh, for the cultural change that being the first woman milestone helped bring about. She joined NASA in 1978, now generations ago, and the times and the assumptions about women, what women could or should be doing were quite different then from what we're familiar with today. Could you fill us in, and particularly our younger viewers, and give us some idea of how different it was and what those barriers were like that Sally and the other women who joined the space program were breaking down? Thanks, Jeff um, and Joanne. I'll tell you, this is so personal for me in so many ways because not only um, was Sally a good friend of mine because as Joanne mentioned I covered NASA for so many years um, but I've lived through all those changes that you've just referred to Jeff and as a reporter I was one of the people that was kicking in some glass doors of my own to, mm -hmm. to make it possible for others to other women to follow. Um, Sally Go back a little bit. Sally was born in 1951 at a time when women's rights were marginal and um, space travel was essentially science fiction. And she grew up at a time when suddenly science became more important and certainly women's issues became more important and women were now allowed to do allowed by a society that didn't let us before to do things that were not possible before. Sally understood perfectly well that she was a beneficiary of the women's movement, uh, the modern women's movement which starting in the late 1960s, early 70s 
had really made it possible for women to be in places where they had not been before. So by the time um, 1977 rolled around, when Sally first spotted the article uh, in the Stanford Daily, her university newspaper, saying that NASA was going to recruit women, there were huge changes. And uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton had already started to admit women. Imagine a time when they didn't. Um, government agencies were under a mandate um, to get rid of both um, sex and uh, gender and racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And all these doors were suddenly flung open so that Sally and the other women in that first astronaut class of 1978 totally benefited from this. It really, in so many ways, was a changed society, totally changed. You had one anecdote that seemed particularly telling to me, uh, where you related how, I think this is just after Sally's first uh, STS mission, Johnny Carson was doing a monologue and telling jokes, and you described oh, no, this how was, this flat. Was, let me interrupt you. It was right before she flew, which was sort of the point. Good. And Sally was named in 1982 for her to be the first American woman in space. There were six women in that first class. Sally was the first to be given a flight. And this was a very big deal. And Johnny Carson, at one point early on, her mission was delayed very slightly. There was a schedule change. There was no real mm -hmm. delay. And Johnny Carson joked on The Tonight Show that the um, uh, the seventh shuttle mission on which the first American in space would fly had been delayed so that Sally Ride could find a purse to match her shoes. Yes. Now, uh -huh. now it is funny, and, and I'll laugh at that one too, but when I tell you that I've now looked at all the Carson tapes over the course of the year while Sally was in training, the jokes got worse and worse. They were frat house gags, and the audience, to their great credit, started out by laughing, and then over the course of the year, as the jokes devolved into these terrible, um, sexist, uh, uh, awful things um, about her body, about her underwear, about really stupid stuff, the audience first groaned and then booed. And what had happened was the concept of the first American woman in space had gone from being a punchline to a matter mm -hmm. of national pride. And mm -hmm. I think that's largely because of the way Sally handled herself, and she made people understand this is a really important big deal thing, not a joke. People today, if they saw a video or film of those first press conferences where Sally and the other new astronauts were being introduced, and then when the mission, when her mission team was being introduced, would be, I think, even shocked by how well, how stupid some of the questions were, how patronizing and sexist they were, right? Yes, indeed. Um, and I, there is a question that I would nominate as the single <laughs> dumbest question ever asked at any press conference anywhere, and I have been to a lot of press conferences. So imagine the scene. We're now in May of 1983. Sally is set to fly in June. She's with her crew of uh, four men and Sally, and they're at the Johnson Space Center, and we're in the press room, and they're up in the front of the auditorium, and they're at a dais, and they're, all the uh, NASA centers are connected electronically around the country, and um, all the questions go along. There were some okay ones, some not so good ones, and then this reporter from Time Magazine says to Sally, Dr. Ride, he says, Dr. Ride, you've been training for a year, um, and I know sometimes it gets very tough in there, and when something goes wrong in the trainer, when there's a glitch, how do you respond? He said, do you weep? <laughs> yes. Oh, God. You know, I I'm sitting in the audience as a reporter. All the reporters just groaned. Now, I would have clawed the guy's eyes out because that's the kind of person I am, and this is why Sally was the absolute best person to choose. She let You see her roll her eyes. Um, as if to say, who is this guy really? You see her kind of half smile, and then she turns to Rick Houck, who is the pilot of mm -hmm. her mission, mm -hmm. and she says to the audience, why doesn't anyone ever ask Rick these questions? And she <laughs> totally diffused it. I'm, now, I would actually encourage everyone to find this audio videotape. It exists. You just have to see um, the expression on Sally's face is quite wonderful. 
Well, it's it's part of your book trailer uh, that Simon and yes. to helped you. Uh, it's it's great, yeah, and I, I've been sharing it. So if you guys are looking for that clip, look look on my various social medias because I've been sharing that video um, because it gives a nice encapsulation of the book and Sally Wright's life. But not everything. I'm going to let Jeff take over because you had a question that I interrupted. No, I was just. This is such a big, a big and important topic, I think, and one of the things that the book is really good about doing. And this was just the follow-up thing to say, you know, those, even this is just 30 years later. I mean, to me, that seems like not very long at all. And it, it, it's a demonstration, isn't it, of how much things have changed, and we can see how important Sally's uh, contribution to that was. And I was thinking too about about celebrity and the idea of celebrity. It's like she was chosen. She she uh, put herself in the right place at the right time, but there was some, you know, randomness, hand of fate involved in being chosen. And I think the the exciting thing about celebrity is not getting there, which can be an accident, but what you do with it. And she did some amazing things then with her celebrity that really moved things along uh, and oh, made I this change I happen so quickly, right? And, yeah, indeed, and I think, Jeff, you have gotten at a very key part of Sally's personality, which I think is one of the great lessons we can learn from her. You know, I call um, everything I've gotten out of this, I knew Sally quite well, but I learned so much more about her when I did the book, and I call them flying lessons, because I think she taught us all to fly high without ever leaving Earth. And I think one of the biggest lessons I got was Sally's ability to pivot when an opportunity showed itself and not to look back and her insistence that yeah luck was really good but being prepared is even better so mm -hmm. there she is at Stanford this has all happened around her she had no idea NASA was looking for women as astronauts she reads an article this is a woman who was dead set on being a, a scientist a phys her, her PhD was in astrophysics she was going to teach she was going to do academic research. She said to her best friend in college, I'd like to be famous. I'd like to win the Nobel Prize. Um, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, she reads an article where NASA is recruiting women, and boom, she pivots, and she moves ahead. And I used to say to her, you know, you really were very lucky that it's what you just said, Jeff, that accidental moment. And she said frequently, yes, I was lucky, but I was prepared. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning she had gone after something she cared about. She loved science. She cared deeply that other people share the mystery, the joy, the beauty of science. And she went where her heart took her and where her brain took her. And then, yeah, she got lucky that all the timing was right. But then once again, as you say, she took wonderful advantage of it. She became the perfect first American woman in space. Um, she fulfilled her responsibilities brilliantly on the space shuttle and then afterwards when she went and, and spoke to the, uh, to the folks out there about what was going on. Oh, <laughs> I got distracted by Jeff's chat. So there's, for those of you who, who've not participated in a, re or a hangout before, there's a secret chat window here where we can talk to each other. I got, I got a little distracted. Uh, um, so you, now, it, what what you said about Sally being prepared, that's been echoed by uh, Chris Hadfield, who's been here. We, we love our astronauts here on Read Science because they are the perfect advocates for science, technology, engineering, and math. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, you've been covering the space shuttle uh, launches. You've been covering the program for a long time. And um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how astronauts have um, changed in their relationship to uh, the general public over that time, because you have a very unique, uh, special view of this. Oh, I think it's it's been more than a sea change. Um, you know, let's start with before I started. I started covering NASA with the space shuttle program in 1981. I never covered it during the Gemini, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo days. But you know from everything you've read and everything you've seen um, that the astronauts in those days were absolutely, it was hands off to the press. You know, we, press people could not get close to them. Um, they sold, S-O-L-D, for mm -hmm. money, their story to Life magazine. Mm -hmm. um, 
they were treated like gods and they were heroes they were brave courageous individuals but heaven forbid anybody should ever know anything about their private lives that wasn't already sanitized you know the fact that so many astronauts ultimately their marriages broke up you never would have known any of that at the time because there was this lid on um, uh, making them the gods of the, and they were all men and of course all white men at the time um, of our society so then come the shuttle astronauts and for the first time you have this is 19 uh, they were brought in first uh, astronaut class in 1978 Sally's class 35 of them and all of a sudden you have not only the pilots who are going to fly the plane and the commander they will be commanders and pilots with military experience but you have 20 that's 20 to 15 20 mission specialists these are individuals who are scientists who have been perched on mountaintops looking through telescopes <laughs> at stars who have been um, uh, uh, going around the world looking down into the depths of the ocean to find out what the science is there these are not people who were flying um, uh, uh, fighter pilot missions over Vietnam it's a totally different culture they however the scientists got totally caught up in the NASA thing at first which is to say they were all they were all still pretty aloof from the press mm. and it took a while but NASA finally figured out and so did the astronauts that um, with the exception of some reporters we were not there to do them in we were there looking for a story we wanted their story we, want, we wanted to humanize them we wanted to make them real so that people could identify with them and um, I think that um, there's been such a change in the way look at what Chris Hadfield did when he was up in the space station and <laughs> how he related to the country and to the world it was just brilliant and beautiful uh, the closest we got to that in the early space shuttle days was when they would um, uh, have a little press conference or something Earth as for we had the first uh, space to earth press conferences w during the shuttle flights and there was an attempt at sort of relating to the reporters and relating to the humans back on earth but they were still just floating around and doing their thing there's been an enormous change and I give NASA huge credit for that and of course the world has changed um, we're a lot more personal now we we care a lot about people's individual lives and they understand that it's important to share that with us I think so as part of this uh, you know trying to reach more people even before social media came along you proposed a journalist in space program I did because as a reporter I found it very fr uh, NASA let, let me back up and say NASA was a <laughs> great place to learn how to cover the shuttle uh, I was assigned to our ABC News space shuttle team uh, with virtually no science background I mean I'm the one who took botany in high school to get around the science requirement uh, dumb <laughs> dummy that I was uh, I never took a physics course NASA became my school and um, you know in journalism and in life it is true there is no such thing as a dumb question and nonetheless I asked every dumb question you could ask and I got answers and NASA was a wonderful laboratory for me I learned so much from them obviously I did my homework as well and um, it was just it was so I learned a lot from NASA and I knew what was going on uh, to just one little side story before I go on I in the very beginning we had these briefing books that were you know 14 telephone books nobody has a telephone book anymore but that's what they were and they were just immense and I would drag them home and, and study when I got back to New York and I, I was sitting in the living room one night in New York um, going through one of the briefing books and um, I heard the phone ring in the other room and I heard my husband pick it up and here's what I heard hello oh hi great fine we're fine no 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 Lynn can't go out to dinner until she learns how to land the space shuttle <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody had called up to invite us out to dinner and my husband decided I was going nowhere until I memorized every one of those briefing books anyway having said that <laughs> so I got the techno talk down and I finally learned what the acronyms all meant and um, and I think I did a pretty good job explaining it to my viewers but the astronauts would return and we would say to them what was it like 
describe what you saw. And generally the answer was neat. Or perhaps cool. It was cool. <laughs> So a group of us said, this is this will not do. This will not do. We need a little more, you know, and and maybe the solution is fly one of us. You've got to fly a journalist because we're the only ones that know how to describe things well. So we lobbied and lobbied, and I actually sh shamelessly, I did a whole piece on it, uh, which I considered my application. And then I did, a, then they did, um, uh, establish a journalist in space project. It was run by a wonderful fellow named Alan Ladwig, and he was running all the citizens in space things. And I applied. Uh, Sally volunteered to write me a recommendation because she thought it would be a good idea uh, to have folks out there explain it. These are early days. And um, I applied and I went through the interview process and I was one of 40, as you say, semi-finalists. Um, and then the decision was made they were going to fly a school teacher first and after the Challenger explosion the journalist in space competition was ended and never resurrected. So I came close, I would have gone in a heartbeat but didn't happen. That's, that's amazing and I love that story. I love that the book weaves in not only Sally's stories but yours and it's done really well but before we get back to that which I'm sure Jeff will uh, help do that too, <laughs> we have a question from the audience and they are asking do you think your lack of science background actually made it easier to report science to the lay people? I think it really did. I think the fact that I had to ask uh, dumb questions and I say that because I really don't believe there are dumb questions. Um, if I could understand it, then I could make it clear to my viewers. And I think that there were any number of longtime science and space correspondents who fell into the trap of using all the acronyms, of assuming the audience knew more that they did, of not asking that follow-up question, which frequently got you the better answer. So I think to a great extent, yeah. You know, it was like, remember the cereal commercial with Mikey, let Mikey try it, let Mikey try and see if he likes it. I was Mikey. You know, well, if Lynn can understand it, then everybody else will. And I... And I'm very proud of that because I think that I did know how, how things worked ultimately. And um, very frequently when I was monitoring the air to ground what, in the middle of a mission, I would hear a transmission and I knew I could give our folks a heads up because I knew something wrong uh, had gone wrong and we were about to get an announcement. So um, yes, I think that's a big part of it. All of which is by way of saying don't let your lack of background stop you ever. You can get the information, you can do it and make a better product for it. This is the first time I think on Read Science that we've talked about a biography uh, and that's very exciting. I think exciting. you're right. I, I think you're right. Yeah, and that, that brings up some questions and I'd like some questions about uh, process and things too. But I want to start with, um, you know, as a scientist People, there are famous scientists in history who are more like colleagues to me than they are the, um, I don't know, the marble carved busts that they are to the public at large. And sometimes I chafe a little when when great names in science are, seem to me idolized too much. And I'm wondering if you're going to write a biography, and here you are writing a biography about Sally Ride, who's a very interesting character at a very interesting time in history, doing very interesting and milestoney first woman things. Where is the line? Where do you choose the line between too personal on one hand and too heroic on the other hand? I think you found it in this one, and Joanne and I were talking the other day about how masterfully, because you make it look easy, you move from your story, her story, stories about the time and things, um, and just sort of flow along through those without making them individual chapters, and that makes the book very, very readable. But goodness, how do you decide where the line is? It must have helped that you knew Sally and you were good friends with her, I think. It did help. and. I guess I knew from the beginning that it was going to be a combination of personal stuff about Sally and about me, since I lived through it all, and the science. And don't forget, when Sally died in July of 2012 uh, at the age of 61 from pancreatic cancer, um, not only did most of us not know that, I did not know mm -hmm. she had been diagnosed and took only 17 months start to finish. Um, 
But the new, it was also revealed that she'd been in a relationship with another woman for 27 years, which had not been known publicly before, and by the way, nor was it known by me. Sally was a good friend. She frequently stayed with me in New York City. Um, she never told me this. Um, and her partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy, is the one who decided that she thought it ought to be public after Sally died, and Sally agreed several days before her death that it was okay with her, but... but um, this was Tam's doing, basically. So I knew I wanted and had to tell that part of the story. So it wasn't a question of invading anybody's privacy. Poor Sally was gone. Mm -hmm. um, clearly she did not want this out there when she was alive, but uh, Tam did, and her family agreed, and her sister and her mom, and so th there was that. Um, clearly I was going to tell the NASA story. Clearly, I was going to tell the story about the changes in women's issues and the socialization, the change of social uh, status in this country over the years. And um, uh, when you ask Jeff, how do you do it, uh, the answer is it's hit or miss. And I am blessed with a couple of really smart friends who, who saved me from myself on many occasions. And having people read the book, read the early manuscript and say, this is great. I think you went a little too far here, or why don't you push a little bit more here? And I'd rather, you know, it's really good. You, no book is an island. You really don't do it all by yourself. Mm -hmm. The mistakes are your own. But luckily, there's outside people, editors and friends, who just look at it and say, "This is good. This is not good." And I, you know, as a television correspondent, I love the teamwork of producing a, a TV program, and I always enjoyed that while I was there at ABC and elsewhere. Uh, as a writer, you're much more on your own, so you really do rely on other people's eyeballs. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's you're making a cocktail, you're making a meal, you're making, you're creating something, and it's, it's, uh, you, you go with it as long as you can in one direction, and then you move on back to where it, where it needs to be. And well, Sally's and story, to me, had to be chronological, so I did it that way. Oh, her you did it so well. Yeah. Oh. So her well. relationship with Tam is, I think, because of the time when you're writing, when things happen, is is a significant, an important part of the story to tell, and it's good. And I think I think it's um, it's great that you were forthright. We start out. That's part of the you know getting things set off right. And I'm trying to remember when when she did die. That I think the reaction was generally uh, generally pretty positive. And a lot different than yeah it would have been whether she was right about being quote private about it well she was who she was and that's that's right. what it was and she did come from a different time but um, that's another thing that that has been uh, shattered that things have changed and the reaction to to this news from Tam when Sally died um, is a lot different than it would have been. Oh, I think that's true. You know, uh, I can't do this scientifically because. Um, I only saw what I saw, but the truth is, um, my my judgment from everything I read online and in print after Sally died and listened to and watched is that the general feeling was, um, well, so she was gay, so what? And mm -hmm. I understand why she might have wanted to keep it private. There was a very, very small um, uh, a, a group of individuals um, in the LGBT community who were very unhappy who said why didn't she come out she could have done mm -hmm. our cause so much good and the truth is she could have uh, and the other truth is she chose not to yeah. and uh, Sally stood up for many many causes that she believed in for women's rights for science issues for girls in middle school learning science for women in athletics for all kinds mm -hmm. of things for saving planet earth and this was just one that she apparently chose not to, um, yeah. not to be the spokesperson for. And don't forget, this is a supremely private individual. I don't think yeah. I've ever known anyone as private as Sally Woods. Genetically, she was an introvert. And she had to force herself to be out there on the public stage all the time mm -hmm. and did it beautifully. But it was a hassle for her. It, was, it took a deep um, psychic price on her soul. And I think had she sort of gone with the times, the country after all had changed enormously, mm -hmm. um, and had she come out as a gay woman, 
I think any privacy she had left would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I think she just didn't want to be the poster child for it, and that was her choice. I think you're right. It was it was her personality and where it flowed from the time, and people still won't recognize or appreciate now so so viscerally the the well the stupid masculine sexist attitudes at NASA that were were not yet changed but were starting to change. Uh, and, yet, and, and, and Jeff, let me interrupt that. I think protecting NASA was a huge part of what Sally was doing. Yeah. Notice I said sure. protecting NASA, not protecting herself. She didn't mm -hmm. really much care what people thought or said about her as much as there were, there were she loved NASA. And, um, and she wanted very much to spare them anything, I believe. And um, she was concerned about how the news of her uh, sexuality was going to affect the astronaut office, and then she decided whatever Tam wanted was fine. So right. she had NASA in mind all along, and it was um, stupid and macho and sexist for many, many years. It took 25 years to get a woman up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really silly, right? <laughs> yes. And I thought it, I thought it was, um, see what I was saying. I was, a bit, I was surprised when she married Steve Hawley. It's like, oh really? Come on, girl! And yet, you know, I'm I'm old enough, so I, I and I remember the times. So like it seemed normal. And what was more interesting and more refreshing was when you told the story of how she talked to him and said, "Steve, we were here, and now we're here, and I think I need to move on past this marriage." That seemed almost out of character and very bold and forthright too. To recognize that she'd fallen in love with Tam, she was starting a new relationship, and well, she acknowledged that. Don't forget, she did not tell that to Steve. All she said to Steve was, "I don't want to be married anymore." Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Steve, Steve found out on his own that she was with Tam many years later. Uh, he assumed it was because um, Sally was ready to leave NASA, and that Steve had no intention of leaving mm -hmm. NASA at that point. He had flown yeah. a few times and wanted to fly more, so. Um, he took it at face value, and in retrospect, and his his remarks in the book, and it's the first interview he's ever done on the subject, um, indicate that he really, you know, he he wondered if the marriage wasn't wasn't falling apart already. He saw it, um, mm -hmm. and was sort of prepared to do something himself, but didn't quite know how. So I think, you know, I think the fact that Sally got herself out of the marriage, on the one hand, is is hundred percent Sally. She wants to do something. She doesn't. The fact that she didn't tell Steve why and that she kept their relationship private from him or secret um, is also who Sally was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it was a different time. Absolutely. Well, and um, just the, the way you're talking and describing the events in the book is just bringing back my feelings as I was reading this book. And I just really can't say strongly enough to our uh, viewers out there that this book is magnificent. I felt like I knew Sally. I felt like I felt like she could have written this book. I don't know if she would have, but I was just so moved by this book. I almost like have tears in my eyes. That's that's how good this book was. And when it ended, I was like, darn, you know, not only is the book done, but like she's gone, right? Yeah. And well thank you. Thank you for saying that. You would have loved having her on this on this oh. hangout. She would have been um, more fun than you can imagine. And I, I can't, you know, I can't be Sally. I can only share with you that she was funny and witty and mischievous and had a great uh, ability to explain complicated things in an easy way. And she had some eloquence. Uh, I think one of my one of my favorite of Sally's lines was, you know, kids. But always, first question, every kid always asks to an astronaut coming back from space, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Sally had a perfect answer. She said, just imagine you're sitting on a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she had a way to describe everything. That, so, so let's talk about her as a, in her role at, with Sally Ride Science and as an educator and an encouragement for the middle school age girls. Um, and how important that was to her. You know, she didn't join NASA to be the first American woman in space, um, but she liked being the first American woman in space. I totally believe that. She hated uh, the speeches. Um, she hated the demands on her time. 
uh, but she kind of liked it. She liked the doors that it opened. Um, she liked the access that it gave her. Uh, part of her loved being sort of tucked away in the library stacks or in the lab, but she but she liked that that title. Having said that, though, she very very definitely did not want to be the only woman. Being the first was fine. She didn't want to be the only one. Uh, or as Senator Barbara Mikulski, a good friend of Sally's, always says, Sally wanted to be first, but not only, not the only. Yeah. Yeah. And in that effort, she wanted to bring young girls particularly along at a time when society started giving them messages that maybe science wasn't cool for kids. And Sally never faced that in her life. She, mm -hmm. she grew up with parents who knew nothing about science but who utterly encouraged her to do whatever she wanted. She had teachers who, who saw her scientific streak and let her go with it. So she didn't have that problem but she understood that little girls who of course starting out little girls and little boys all like science equally but when they got to a certain age somewhere in middle school they start getting signals from society that says well maybe it's not cool to be a scientist maybe it's a little geeky and maybe science means being alone in a basement in a white lab coat with hair like Einstein's and maybe that's and this is a time when little girls just want to be pretty and look like other little girls and um, she undertook to turn that around and that's what Sally Ride Science is for where they're training teachers to get at these kids to to involve them to engage them to make them commit to science and to help them understand that it is just fun and that's the message Sally wanted to get out there science is fun it's marvelous it's miraculous but mostly you can have a great time doing this I mean what a message right it's it's amazing and I, I even think of her becoming an astrophysicist at the time I mean it wasn't like she just sidled into a little bit of science she really <laughs> dove in and uh, you know it's amazing because actually um, my my second child my oldest daughter is a physics major here at University of Illinois and I'm like you have to read this book about Sally Ride. Oh good. Oh she good. Goes, but I don't have time but I want to. <laughs> you know and I and I I play a little game with people as a journalist I've always done this and I also do this in social settings and I'll say to somebody if I woke you up in the middle of the night and I said uh, give me the one word that describes who you are. Uh, in my case, my personal case, what's the one word? Is it woman? Is it feminist? Is it lover of drafts? Is it journalist? Is it, you know, there's a million things that could be. If you woke Sally up in the middle of the night, what would, what would she have said? And every one of her friends said either scientist or physicist. Mm -hmm. That at S, it wasn't astronaut. Um, she was only at NASA for nine years. And um, that was clearly what made her career and what made her a famous person and what enabled her to do everything else she did. But at heart, she really cared about understanding how the world works. She really cared about saving planet Earth. She really cared about why this connects to this, connects to that. There's a little bit of the engineer in her as well. She's a physicist. She's an astrophysicist. But I think there was a little bit of the engineer. She liked to fix things. And um, that's a very important part of her. She seems to have convinced you that science can be interesting. That's, that's rather nice. How does she do that? Um, you know, I, I guess I always figured out once I, once I got beyond the bot. What, no, let me, let me back off a little bit. When I, <laughs> when I became a grown up and I got out in the real world, I, I lamented. I love botany. Nothing against botany, botanists. Please don't get angry at me. It was a great uh, uh, science to study. But I, many times, even before I got to NASA, wished I had studied physics because I also like knowing how the world works. I had done chemistry in high school, but not in college. Um, I used to tell Sally that I was going to come out to uh, University of California, San Diego when she was there, and I wanted to take her course, which she called Physics for Poets. And I would, I've now, having done the research on her and read her notebooks, it just looks like this wonderful moment where she taught um, she taught people who don't have a science background how to understand science, and that would have been great. But I sort of came to it before that, although I, w I will say hanging out with Sally and Steve, which I did a lot when I was uh, covering NASA, and being at their house was a riot because they, 
they did talk in kind of bullet points and they did talk in kind of science terms and there were a lot of acronyms and I learned a lot and it was fun just hanging out with a bunch of science geeks if you will they were they, they they're just cool and that that's what Sally said over and over with Sally Ride Science with her company we have to make science cool again yeah. we have to make science something that people want to be the way they used to want to be cheerleaders and the way they used to want to be um, home ec majors. I don't know, did anyone ever really want to be a home ec major? <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> but we have to make science cool and that's so fun to think about. It's really exciting. Uh, so uh, going back, you, you were talking about her time at UCSC. Um, she, when she left NASA and she was looking for a position, this was hard to come by as she wanted to be a professor and this was, you would think it would be a cakewalk and it wasn't. Well, what an interesting story. You know, she left NASA, and the first thing she did was she worked, um, she was a fellow at a think tank, an, an arms control think tank at Stanford, run by uh, the Nobelist uh, Sid Drell, the very eminent uh, physicist. And after that was up, and that's where Sally, by the way, another one of the fellows was Condi Rice, with whom Sally struck up an immediate and long friendship. Um, as soon, when that was over, Sally, as you say, Joanne, wanted to teach. She wanted a professorship somewhere. She wanted to go back to her first love, teach physics. Stanford wouldn't, and Stanford was her first choice. She had gotten her ma undergraduate or master's and her PhD at Stanford, and Stanford wouldn't accept her. Uh, why? Because she hadn't published. Uh, mm -hmm. First American woman in space had, had she had done some science while she was at NASA. The NASA encouraged the scientists to keep up with their their science um, projects, but it, there was just no time to really do the kind of work you, you needed to do. So Stanford rejected her, and at the exact moment, UCSD offers her not only a tenured professorship, but she could be she could run something called the California Space Institute, CalSpace, and Sally. Once again, pivots, goes south, goes down to UCSD, and never looked back, and spent the next quarter century of her life there. Uh, another lesson, don't agonize over the things you can't do. Figure out the next thing, and just move on, and that's what she did. Yeah, you, you brought through uh, several aspects of her personality like that uh, very clearly, and, and made me enviable. And Another thing I envied was she was clearly why I mean she was an athlete she was a natural mm -hmm. for the rigors of space training she was she was um, trim she was five five and a half um, never weighed more than a hundred and mm, ten fifteen maybe twenty was a lot um, mm. no body fat whatsoever um, and wanted to be a professional tennis player at one point and almost made it she was she would she could have been a professional tennis player she never would have been the elitist of the elite and she figured that out later in life and she decided not to pursue it any further later in life people would say Sally what stopped you from being a professional tennis player she would always say my forehand uh, which is probably true but for, again what she thought about tennis went back but she played tennis um, she played rugby which agonized her mom when Sally was at Stanford. <laughs> Rugby is a rough sport. Uh, she ran, uh, she swam, she did everything. And yes, she was uh, therefore very good at training uh, for the astronaut corps. I, when, when I would be at NASA on other people's missions, sometimes I would have to spend four or five or a week at a time, uh, days or week at a time at the Johnson Space Center. And if it wasn't Sally's mission and if she wasn't out of town, she would take me over to the racquetball court and kill me on the racquetball court. Um, and in that awful Houston humid heat, she would run constantly, ran every day. Um, the astronauts had to keep in good shape. So she was a wonderful athlete, and I think it made a huge difference in um, uh, being as agile as she was in the training. Yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't save her in the end. Pancreatic cancer is a terrible cancer, yeah. but... Does it, yeah, it doesn't care if you're in, in good shape. That's a completely exactly. different physiological system. Um, and she, so, as you said, the previous astronauts, they were known for being these, you know, flight, flying in wars and flying jet fighters. Well, Sally went ahead and learned how to fly jet fighters, didn't she? And it seemed like she just really took to that. 
like like uh, uh, you know whatever your favorite analogy is I have never seen anybody so happy as when she talked about flying she got to NASA having never flown anything other than as a passenger in a commercial jet like the rest of us and soon she's in the back all the astronauts had to learn how to fly T-38s those sleek white trainers uh, su supersonic backseaters they were backseaters they couldn't sit in the front seat there was always a trained pilot in the front seat but every one of the pilots I talked to said that Sally was the best student they had. She picked it up really quickly. I believe a lot of it had to do with her tennis. She had great hand-eye coordination and um, she really enjoyed it. And they weren't supposed to, but they let her they let her land the thing. They let her fly it at very low altitudes, which they weren't supposed to do. Um, she liked it so much she took a part interest in a Grumman Tiger, a decidedly different kind of plane. <laughs> so that she could uh, just fly around on weekends. In fact, flew herself to Kansas uh, the, for the weekend when she married Steve. That's right. Um, that was a good story. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then they flew home in the Grumman, and, um, and it was her Grumman. It wasn't Steve's. Steve was also a pilot, of course, learned how to be. But Sally, according to all the, all the um, military pilots, former military pilots I talked to, said oh, she was just a great student and a terrific pilot. Speaking of, of Steve, and this is part, I have uh, a few quotations that mostly struck me as, you know, the, the things that sort of seem to glow in neon in the book to say, this is Sally. And in one of them, you, you quoted Steve, let me see if I can find it, uh, as saying she didn't really care about being first, she cared about being good. And that seems like something that underlines all of these anecdotes that you're telling us. I think that's true. I think... Um, I'm going to modify that slightly though. I think it is definitely true about why she went to NASA. It's definitely true about her underlying feeling. Uh, I also think there is no question that among the six women, there was a competition and they all mm. wanted to be first. The problem is nobody knew what the criteria were, so there was no way to compete. <laughs> So, you know, George Abbey, who was the head of the office, uh, the, the guy that made the selections, uh, didn't let you know uh, what you were supposed to be. So they all tried everything they could, but mostly they just all were the very best they could be. And, of course, mm -hmm. let's not forget, every one of those first six women flew, um, some several times. Um, and Anna Fisher is still working at NASA, no longer as an astronaut, but she is still at the Space Center in, in uh, Houston. So the oh. first six women were quite extraordinary. While you're there, since you mentioned Anna Fisher, I particularly wanted you to relate the story about when she was the Cape Crusader and the night that she spent <laughs> uh, before Sally's first mission That's in the great. shuttle. It's a great um, story. <laughs> so, so every astronaut in the astronaut office has a job during someone else's mission. Uh, if you're not actually training for the mission, you are a support person in some way, shape, or form, probably. Either you're flying in a T-38, flying chase, or taking pictures, which are very important, photographing from up, uh, filming, or you are doing ground support. And there was a group of them called Cape Crusaders. And the Cape Crusaders uh, are the ones who did all the stuff uh, at the Cape for the crew. So mm -hmm. they would help you. They would set things up. Um, on the, uh, I want to say the dashboard, the flight controls and everything. They would make sure things were protected. Um, they were, they served as liaison with the families, all sorts of things. And one of the things that would happen is, um, I think it's around uh, 24, 36 hours before the flight, the commander and the pilot are in the, in the shuttle, up in the cockpit, and they set all the switches. So everything is set to be where it's supposed to be with the closeout crew and all of that. And then somebody, one of the Cape Crusaders, stays in the cockpit on the flight deck, that is to say, overnight and guards it, basically. It's two things. It is a security thing, or was. I don't know what they did finally mm. by SCS-135, but in the early days it was partly security. And it was partly so that nobody getting in there would inadvertently knock a switch and flip it from one way to the other. The person who was the Cape Crusader doing that the night before Sally's first flight was Anna Fisher, who was at the time eight months pregnant. Yes. And the image of this woman 
um, sitting in one of the seats, of course, lying there with her big belly, guarding the <laughs> flight deck for the first American woman about to fly is just great. I love that story, too. <laughs> This is something that would not have happened in the Mercury Gemini and Apollo no, days. No. No. <laughs> not at no, all. No. <laughs> Jeff likes that story. <laughs> I do. Well, it's great. It's all much. that she, you know, and Anna wound up being the first woman to fly um, uh, after she had a baby. And, of course, her daughter, uh, Kristen, became the astro tot and, and went on to become and is yeah. now a television reporter and loves covering aviation in space. So. Yeah. Well, like Lynn said, it is such a picture. It's very entertaining, but it also was such a symbol of all that was going on. and all Because yeah. there you had a pregnant woman as the Cape Crusader in the space shuttle on the flight deck keeping but an wait, eye Jeff, on them. Jeff, I have to tell the other part of the story, which I also love, which is, which is for all the progress, which you rightly cite just now, <laughs> Anne also was walking by the ONC, the operations in the, the the building where the astronauts stay uh, earlier in the day, and another former astronaut, a woman, told me that she saw Anna walk by in her flight suit, clearly pregnant, and a NASA um, official, well, it was the NASA administrator actually, yeah. walked by and said, "Hi, Sally, have a good Hi, flight." Sally. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to some people, they were still all the same person. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah. He, she was all women at NASA at the time, apparently, and it happened more than once, as you said. And so, just just a um, a quickie when I was uh, for you here to respond to when when I was reading about the press conferences, the early things and stuff, and the question that came to mind: What is it with Americans and toilets? <laughs> Uh, what is it with America? Boy, this is a profound question, Jeff. I'm not sure I oh, can yeah. get an answer. I saved the I best. Think, you know, I think it, it goes to the fact that you just want to relate. You want to figure out what are they doing that I do. Well, I, you know, I don't know how to fly a space shuttle, but they're living up there. Talk to me about living. Mm -hmm. We're also fascinated by what they eat when they're up there. Mm -hmm. We're fascinated by, remember, space ice cream and all that stuff, all that awful stuff. And we wanted to know how you do that. And I think that um, there just is, it's a very primal concern. How, what would I, how would I behave up there in that circumstance? And... There you go, right to the bathroom. You know, it's get it. Oh, we seem to have a little uh, issue with there. Uh, we heard we heard most of your thing, Lynn. Uh, maybe say something and see if. Uh, sure. Have you lost me? Testing yeah. one, two, three. So, yep, you're there now. You're it just garbled at the very end, but we I think we all got the gist of it. So interestingly, okay. we've had Mary Roach on as a guest, and she wrote "Packing to Mars," and of course she had to approach that topic. And, uh, yeah. But here's here's what Sally loved. Sally loved the fact that kids would always ask that question first, and it always took adults oh, 10 or 12 questions right. before somebody would ask. Everybody wants to know the answer, but she liked the unfiltered uh, spontaneity of children way better than adults. <laughs> so uh, actually, um, g given everything I read about Sally, where she, you know, is, if she's done with something, she's done. She moves on, no regrets. And any hint ever that there was anything she regretted? Oh, what an interesting question. No, I don't, I, I can't think of anything. Um, I think if you had asked her, she might have said, um, we have to get that bill through Congress, or we have to get one more girl, and we have to get one more program, and we have to get one more one more uh, uh, partnership with NASA, and let's put this on the space station. There were always more projects. I don't think, however, she would have regretted. There was no coulda, shoulda, woulda with Sally. Mm -hmm. She um, she lived, she often said, she lived very much in the moment. She also didn't look forward. She was not a future thinking person mm -hmm. in terms of her own life plans. Uh, to Tam's great frustration, I might add. Um, didn't know she'd but, be around in 10 years, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we'll, let's check in another five years. We'll see how this relationship goes. So, um, <laughs> no, she was not a planner in that regard, uh, forward or back. She lived in the moment, and and that's why 
she was such a superb astronaut, that's why she was such a superb professional, and it's why she was such a good friend. Because when you were with her, you were with her, and she talked to you, and she wasn't, uh, you know, she wasn't on her cell phone. She wasn't checking her Blackberry. She wasn't wondering, looking around the cocktail party to see if there was somebody more interesting to talk to. She was talking to you, and that's what made her so much fun. That's wonderful. I think um, we, we are approaching the last five minutes, and uh, something that's come to my mind is the, the Rogers Commission. The, the whole, um, the, it, the, the explosion of Challenger, that put a kink in things. And that changed her a bit and changed her relationship with mm. NASA. So why don't we cover that as our, our last topic? Well, Sally was deeply disappointed, upset, angry at the Challenger explosion. The astronauts who died were, of course, all her friends with whom she had grown up in the program for, for uh, uh, 1978, for eight years. Um, she often said... She would think about where Judy Resnick was sitting, which is in the, the, on the flight deck. Um, she was the flight engineer, as was Sally in her missions, and um, knew, therefore understood what Judy might have gone through. It was devastating for Sally. And she worked very hard to get information, and she did. She was the first person, actually, to get information proving that NASA, some in NASA management, in fact, knew that the um, rubber in the O-rings would not withstand the super cold temperatures of launch day. Mm -hmm. And she was very angry at that part of NASA. She didn't... Uh, damn them all with the same tar brush, uh, to mix 12 metaphors here. <laughs> she understood there was one group of management that was really bad, and she didn't want revenge. She wanted to make it better. And her whole emphasis was, let's get at the truth. Again, it was the engineer, it was the physicist saying, let's find out what happened. And once she did, let's put controls in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. For a while, that was so. Uh, then it happened again with Columbia, exact same problem. She's the one who famously said during the Columbia investigation, um, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo here. It was mm -hmm. the same problem, flawed management. Once again, it wasn't destroy NASA, it was let's make it better, let's fix it. And that was always her concern. Um, she was instrumental in both investigations in making things understood and then in making them better. Um, and we're and we wound up with a better space program in both cases because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's she's amazing, and um, the the book is amazing. Um, I I don't know if I could I want to read it again, but I don't know if I could because I feel like my heart would get broken <laughs> all over again. Um, but um, yeah. um, just knowing she's gone. But with the last few minutes, Lynn, is there anything we didn't ask you that you would love to make sure uh, the audience knows about Sally? I I want to make sure people understand what fun she was. You know, my memory of Sally, my favorite memory of Sally is the night before her first flight. So now we're in June of 1983. She's the most famous person on the planet. She's on the cover of every magazine. Nobody can get near her. Astronauts are in quarantine before they fly. I'm preparing my script in the ABC workspace for that night's piece. And the phone rings. Someone says, Lynn, it's for you. I picked it up. And a little voice says, hi there, what are you doing in five minutes? I said, I don't know, Sally, what am I doing in five minutes? She said, walk outside, turn left, go down the gravel path and stop. I did that. There was Sally, 50 yards away, in cutoffs, in flip-flops, in a t-shirt, big smile on her face, pushing the envelope a little bit. She wasn't supposed to be in contact with the press. Knew I wouldn't do anything bad with the information. There was nothing to do. Waving at me and letting me know she was fine. America's first woman in space was just fine and very excited. And I could report that on the air that night. That's my image of Sally. Mm -hmm. Playful, mischievous, pushing a little, a little bit against rules, but ultimately a great team player when you needed her. I have one quotation I've been saving because it it was about Sally it was about it's about our philosophy here at Read Science and this is written in your voice you're writing in your introduction where you said her trust in science led to her conviction that a scientifically literate nation is our only hope yes we believe that you believe that anything you want can say that you know says yes we need to integrate science into our lives it's it's important. It keeps keeps things going. 
I, I believe that was her life's motto. Um, I believe that's what kept her going and made her go. I believe that when she was in space and looked down and saw the thin, what she called the thin blue line of the Earth's mm -hmm. atmosphere, that royal blue line, which she later described also as um, as thin as the fuzz on a tennis ball, um, <laughs> that that was the only thing protecting our planet from the harsh reality of outer space. Uh, we wouldn't be here. You and I would not be having this conversation. There'd be no lakes. There'd be no green. Uh, this really motivated her, and she un that's why she thought understanding science was so important because it made it possible for us to live here on Earth, and she wanted us to continue to be able to do that. What a wonderful conversation we've had. Lynn, you have been a perfect guest, and we appreciate the work you have put in. We appreciate your friendship with Sally, and we are very glad that you joined us today. And thank you to all of you who tuned in uh, to to watch this. And um, remember, you can check this out on YouTube uh, if you joined us only part way through. And now I guess you're all probably chomping at the bit to see what Apple has to say. So, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thank you. It's always wonderful to join you. So. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks, Lynn, so much for being with us. It was great fun. Thank you both. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks to the audience. Hey, thank you. All right.